Good morning and welcome to this pre-recorded worship service uh, from our house. Thank you for being with us. Today is Sunday, March 29th, and we are going to, again, worship God together even though that we are not together. Even though we're not side by side, we're going to worship God in spirit and truth. Today we're going to sing a few songs. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. We will not be partaking of it uh, literally, but we will go through the actions. We'll say the prayers and we'll give you time to partake of those things uh, because this is pre-recorded. And of course, for your contribution, it has been asked that you mail that to the church office or deliver it uh, if you can, if at all possible. But that needs to be done. That is part of our worship and that is certainly a necessity even for the continuing work of the church. We're going to sing a few songs. We'll take up the Lord's Supper. We'll pray. We will uh, have a scripture reading this time. We failed to do that last week, and we are going to do scripture reading from this point forward, and then we will have a study together. Again, if you would uh, contact me in any way that you have through phone, through text, through Facebook, or uh, even a message to the office, and, and give me prayer requests. I would love to uh, make those known and to pray with you and for you regarding the needs and concerns you have in your life at this time. This is, again, a, a different way of doing things for us. And we are making do with what we can, with what we have, but it's not ideal. We want to be together. We miss one another. We know the benefit of assembling together on the first day of the week to worship God and this is certainly reminding us of how much we truly get out of assembling together. Let's go to God now in prayer and then Michael will come and lead us in two songs. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for your love and your mercy, your grace that you show upon us every day. We are thankful, Father, that we can worship you and open your word and study it and encourage one another even when we are not sitting beside each other in person even though we are not together in the flesh we know father that we are joined together in spirit we're joined together in our fellowship and in our understanding we're of the same mind and of the same judgment and we're so thankful father to know that we can do these things we pray that what we do and say today is done in spirit and truth that it is acceptable unto thee we pray that we will be diligent in our worship. We pray that we will offer unto you the sacrifices of a holy heart and clean hands. And we pray, Father, that you will accept our worship today. Be with those that we know of, Father. Bless them who are sick. We pray that a cure and a vaccine might be found soon to this virus that's spreading. We pray that uh, the swiftness of its uh, spread might be slowed down. We pray that Doctors and nurses might have safety in executing their duties. We pray that uh, our nation and our world as a whole might get back to our normal course of, of life very quickly. We're thankful for the relief and the remedy and the cure for sin that we have through the blood of your only begotten Son. We're thankful for his life, his death, his sacrifice, and the hope that he gives us of heaven. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Two hundred thirty-eight. If you have your song books, which I assume you do. Um, can you see me? Mm -hmm. Say the name of the song. Holy, holy, holy. First, third, and last verses. And we're just gonna stay tiptoe the entire time now. First, third, and last. This hurts. Um, let's sing. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful. 
First and last verses, and I don't know how to beat the time for this. I'm going up and down. Um, let's say, tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are Now we'll take the Lord's Supper together. If you have those emblems beside you, if you don't, now would be the time to pause the video and to get them. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the body of Jesus Christ. The body that he inhabited on this earth as he came and lived among us. Your only begotten son, a man who suffered and lived and died like we will we pray father that as we partake of this bread which represents his body and the suffering that he went through on the cross in his flesh that we will remember father that it was done for us to forgive us of our sins he the perfect lamb of god sinless and spotless for us we pray this prayer in his name amen
Now we'll take of the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice, his willingness, his knowledge, Father, of your will and his ability to accomplish it. We're thankful, Father, that he allowed himself to be scourged, to be tormented, to be crucified, and his blood shed for us. We pray that we will partake of this fruit of the vine, remembering that our sins have been washed away in his blood. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now Mike is going to come and do our scripture reading. I'll be reading Jeremiah 8, verse, chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Say it again. Give them a, give them a minute to get there. Say it louder. Uh, Jeremiah 8, verses 4 through 8. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, When men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to the seat and refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No right man relents of his evil, saying, What have I done? But everyone turns to his own course, like a horse plunging headlong into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the turtle dove, swallow, and crane keep the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. How, the, how can you say we, we are wise, and the, the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Last week in our study together, we looked at faith. We tried to give a definition and show some examples of those who were walking by faith and those who were not walking by faith. Faith is necessary for our salvation. We're saved by faith. That's part of the process of being saved from our sins. And repentance is necessary unto salvation as well. Repentance is part of the process of being saved from our sins. Our Lord commanded it in Luke 13, verse 3. He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The question was presented to him about some people who had met their fate, had met their end when a tower had fallen on them. It didn't seem like anyone was at fault or, uh, or that any, anyone's sin or wickedness had caused it. But Jesus makes a parallel. and He says, we're all going to die, basically. We're all going to die, and unless you repent, your death will be just as ignominious. It will be just as, uh, just as sad an end as the fate of those upon whom that tower fell. So repentance is definitely part of our salvation. It is part of that process. Have you ever touched a hot eye on a stove? Have you ever grabbed a hair curler that was on and didn't know it? Have you ever touched a live coal? What do you do when you touch something that's hot? You draw back. Your hand immediately withdraws. And that is, in a form, a type of repentance. Your hand is repenting. It's moving away. It's changing. It's deciding your mind is deciding i don't want to do that again because of the consequences your heart has changed about your course of action that's what repentance is this morning we're going to ask that question what is repentance we're going to look at some biblical examples some biblical definitions some passages that give us a clearer picture of repentance it seems like in the world today there are a lot of people who think of themselves as christians who wear the name, who believe that they have a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, but haven't changed their way of life, who are living the same way they lived before 
they became Christians. That's not repentance. Jesus commands repentance. Repentance is part of our salvation. And we then need to have a clear understanding of what repentance is. I asked Sarah what repentance was. And at first she didn't know. She got to thinking about it. And then she said, it's when we stop doing what's bad. When we stop doing what's bad. That's part of it. That's part of the definition. Stop doing what's bad. And we'll get to the rest of it as we continue our study. It's not just stopping doing what's bad, but there's, there's more that has to be done. The first place we're going to go as we consider this is Acts chapter 27. This isn't a place maybe that you'd ever thought about before, but I want to, I want to draw a point from Paul's journey to Rome as he's on this ship and they encounter a storm. And in Acts chapter 27, verse 15, there was nothing that they could do about it, about turning the ship around. They couldn't fight against the storm. They couldn't keep the course that they intended to. And the verse says, when the ship was caught, that is in this tempestuous wind and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. They couldn't change her course. They could not cause that ship to repent. They had a course that they intended to be on. They had a destination that they wanted to reach, but because of the wind, because of the storm, they were going somewhere else. They could not cause that ship to repent. Now, I want us to think then about this account, about the ship that Paul was on as he made his way to Rome when it was caught in the storm. Uh, the circumstances, I believe God probably providentially brought that storm upon them, but the circumstances that they faced caused them not to be able to change the course of that ship. And maybe there are a lot of people who feel that way in the world today. Maybe there are a lot of people who think, I don't know. I don't know how to change. I don't know how to live differently. It's the same things over and over. It's the same sins. It's the same temptations. It's the same setting in which I find myself. And that's just the point. Repentance, godly repentance, is when we don't just settle for that same temptation. We don't settle for the same course of events over and over in our lives. We don't settle for the same sins. We repent. We have changed our course. We're going somewhere different. We don't go to where those temptations take place. We don't follow through with those tests and those trials. We have changed our course. Repentance is, in its most basic definition, a change of of course, but that's not all there is to it. In Matthew chapter 27, after Judas Iscariot had betrayed our Lord, after he had sold him out, he brought the money back to the high priests, to the chief priests and the elders. Matthew 27 verse 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. He changed his course. He decided, I don't want this money anymore. But it wasn't a godly repentance. It wasn't a repentance that led to his salvation. Judas went out and hanged himself. He changed his course. He no longer accepted that money. He, know, he, he knew he had betrayed innocent blood. He repented. But it wasn't a repentance that led to salvation. There are two different kinds of repentance, it would seem. And the Bible, Scripture confirms that for us with these examples like Judas and with what we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, Paul is writing and he's making reference to his earlier letter to 1 Corinthians. And he says, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. That's an interesting phrase as it pertains to repentance. That once repentance is offered, once true repentance, saving repentance, we talked about saving faith, this is saving repentance. Once saving repentance is made in our lives, then we receive damage by you in nothing. Those who truly repent, 
to turn to God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they know now that they're not going to cause damage to their brothers and sisters in anything. They know that they're not going to cause damage to their own soul because they have completely changed their course. But he identifies here that it's possible to be sorry, not in a godly man, to be penitent in such a way like Judas that does not lead to salvation. He says in verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Full repentance, wholehearted repentance, we're not going to re-repent, in other words. We're not going to turn around the other way and go back to our life in the world. Maybe this is, describes those who, who have been obedient to the gospel, who believe that they have been saved, but now they're still living like they lived before. They repented, but then they repented again. Paul says godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, and we're not going to repent, re-repent of that first repentance. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's two kinds of repentance. There is a repentance which leads to salvation. There is a repentance because of godly sorrow, a repentance from sin that we're not going to repent again of. And then there's sorry for getting caught. There is sorry for the consequences that we're going to have to face now. There is a, uh, a repentance of the world, and it does not lead to salvation, but it works death. A murderer who gets caught may be as sorry as anyone, as sorry as any Christian for the sin that he's committed. He may repent with all his heart of that sin, but it doesn't mean that he has turned to God completely. It may mean that he's sorry he got caught. Verse 11 says, For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorry, sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Godly repentance. Repentance that leads to salvation means these things are going to change in our lives. There's going to be a carefulness in our lives. There's going to be a clearing of ourselves. There's going to be indignation over sin. There's going to be fear, respectful reverence towards God. There's going to be a vehement desire to do what's right. There's going to be a desire to revenge those sins that we've committed, to replace them, to make up for them with right and good deeds. That's what godly sorrow works. That's the kind of change that takes place. But... To define repentance as simply a change of course isn't enough. It is that. That is a concept. But we see in Scripture there's two kinds of repentance. There is the repentance that works death. The repentance of a worldly sort. And then there is repentance that leads to salvation. A repentance that is based on an understanding of the sins that we've committed. And a desire to do God's will. To define repentance as a change of course helps us to understand what the Bible means when it says that God repents. God has changed his course. He has. Um, through the pleading and through the intercession of Moses, God repented. When God looked at the world in the days of Noah, Genesis 6 verse 6 says that it repented him that he had made man. He changed his course. He couldn't just go on letting man be as wicked as he was. He had to wipe out all life on the face of the earth, save Noah, his family, and those who were on the ark with him. He changed his course because of the decisions and because of the sin of mankind. But many times throughout Scripture, we are told that God repented. He changed his course. didn't mean that he had sinned, he had been wrong, or he had done something he wished he had not done. It means that he changed his course. It was still right. It was still what was best. His will was still accomplished in bringing salvation into the world through Jesus Christ. But because of the choices of men, because of the unfolding of human, of, of human history, God at times had to change his course. So a basic definition of repentance is a change of course, but to state it more fully, saving repentance 
Repentance that's based on godly sorrow is turning to the correct direction. Thinking again of that ship that Paul was on that they could not cause to repent. They couldn't cause it to turn because of the storm, because of the wind. Our lives can't just turn away from sin, but we have to intentionally turn with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength towards God. As a math teacher, I enjoy geometry. I have taught it several times, and, and I know that it's one that a lot of people don't like, but one of the basic concepts in geometry are parallel and perpendicular lines. The path to heaven and the path to hell are, it would almost seem, parallel. They're going in opposite directions, but they're parallel. In fact, any path that is in any other direction than the one that leads to heaven leads to hell. There's only one path. There's only one door into the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of, of God. Parallel paths go in opposite directions, but so many people, when they repent, they don't turn all the way to God. They don't completely make a 180-degree turn, but they may make a 90-degree turn. They may turn in a different direction. They're no longer doing the same things that they did, but they haven't turned completely to God yet. That does not make them acceptable. Again, there are two kinds of repentance. God's Word is our compass. God's Word is what leads us to God. It points us in the direction of heaven. To turn to anything else, to turn in any other direction, means that our repentance was not a saving repentance. And that's what we read in our scripture reading in Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah speaks as much about repentance, especially as any other Old Testament prophet, maybe as much as anyone else in Scripture. But in Jeremiah chapter 8 in our Scripture reading, he says in verse 6, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rusheth into the battle. It reminds us of those in the days of Judges who were doing what was right in their own eyes. Maybe they realized from time to time that that was not a good idea. That plan, that course of action resulted in a negative outcome. That, that was sin. And they turned from it to something else that was sinful. That's not godly repentance. That's a change of course. But that's not a saving repentance. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 8, he says, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. The implication there is that this nation who has heard from the prophets God's pronounce, pronouncing of judgment upon them, if they turn to him completely, if they turn from their evil, then God says, I will repent. I will change my course in the evil the judgment that I thought to bring upon them. But it's not just turning from their evil to some other form of evil. The implication is there. They have to turn completely to me. They have to turn away from the direction that they're going. Not to some other false direction. But turn completely to me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says in Jeremiah in chapter 26. Jeremiah 26. Verse 3, if so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. It's the same idea there. He told Jeremiah to go and, and speak and to reveal his judgment upon them so that the people would listen. And based on that listening, they would turn away from their evil doings and to him. That's the implication there. It's not just turning away from sin to another form of wickedness, but turning completely to God. Jeremiah 31, verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am the father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. That's not the right verse that I had. 
But the idea from Jeremiah is that not just do we turn away from our sin, or the sin that we were committing to something else that's wicked, but we turn from our sin completely to God with all of our heart. Ezekiel mentions it as well. Ezekiel chapter 14. Verse 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. And there we have this idea that what we're facing is what we want. It's what we desire. It's what we're pursuing. They, were, they had their faces torn, turned toward these idols, towards these abominations. And God says, you must turn away from those things. Turn your faces towards me. That's what we think about sometimes when we describe worship. We're bowing before him. We have our faces toward the throne of God. If our faces are looking at the things of the world while we have our bodies prostrated before him, then our worship's unacceptable. Our faces have to be turned toward him. We can't just be turning from one direction to another. We have to turn completely to him with all of our face, with all of our body, with all of our being. In Acts chapter 26, as, again, Paul is on his missionary work. He is standing, giving an account before Agrippa of his conversion and the things that he had done. In Acts 26, verse 20, he, he explains that upon his conversion, the first thing he did was begin preaching. And he showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that this is what they should do. That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. This was the message that he was preaching throughout the world to the Gentiles who did not know Jehovah God, the God of Israel. Paul thought that he knew. Paul thought that he had a right relationship with his father through the old law, through Phariseeism, through his legal uh, observance of that law. But when he met Jesus Christ, he realized that God was offering salvation to the whole world through his only begotten son. And so he began teaching that they should repent, repent of their sins, repent of their idolatry, repent of their fornication, repent of everything sinful and turn to God. That's the same concept, but it gives us a further definition. It's not just a change of course, but it's turning to the right direction. It's setting our course in the direction of heaven. So repentance is a change of course in its basic sense, but repentance that leads to salvation, repentance that leads to our sins being forgiven means that we have turned to God completely with all of our heart with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. In another way of saying it, it is when we go in our minds, in our hearts, from a state of unacceptability to a state of full submission to God and His commands. I worked in a bank for several years as a teller, and it wasn't unusual. It happened more than once that a counterfeit bill would come through my window. And it was almost too obvious. When you have dealt with, when you've seen, and when you've handled a counterfeit bill, especially after your job is handling genuine, the genuine article all day, every day, you know it. You learn to recognize it. It feels different. It looks different. It has a different thickness. It has a different quality. Many people have a faith that acknowledges that God exists, that acknowledges that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but their lives have not changed. Those who believe that they're saved simply because they believe and that now they don't have to live any differently because once they've been saved, they're always going to be saved. Those who believe they're Christians but have never repented of their sins and turned to God wholeheartedly are counterfeit Christians. You can see it in their walk. You can see it in their daily life, in their manner, in their conduct, their conversation. But a counterfeit is easy to spot. Saul himself, Paul, 
in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 23, he said that he had lived before God in all good conscience before this, unto this day. But he demonstrates this kind of repentance. In Acts chapter 9, in the story of his conversion, as he's going to Damascus, and this light shines upon him and the men who are with him, and a voice calls out to Saul and says, Why are you persecuting me? And he says, Who are you, Lord? Jesus identifies himself. He declares who he is. And then in verse 6 of Acts chapter 9, Saul shows that his heart has changed, that he has repented, that he has turned from persecuting the church that quickly to being one who believes in Jesus Christ, the one that he was seeking to persecute. Because he says, trembling and astonished, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He went from a state of counterfeit faith, a faith that he believed was real and genuine, a, a faith that he believed was acceptable to God, to a state of full submission to Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what repentance is in the New Testament. This is the repentance that is required for salvation. A repentance that that foregoes, that rejects even if necessary the personal pride, the family tradition, and the teaching that we have always been handed down by our pastors and by our televangelists. Repentance is a change that turns us to the Word of God with a full submission to whatever we find therein. This kind of repentance is a repentance that sees the verses that say, unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins, and believes. It looks at the verses that say, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish, and that heart then repents. It's a, it's a heart that looks at the verses that say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And that person submits to the command to be baptized. Repentance means that we turn with our whole heart away from a counterfeit faith. A faith that is unacceptable to God because it has not submitted to His commands for salvation. And it openly accepts what the Bible says about having our sins washed away. 1 Peter 3 verse 21 says that baptism does also now save us. Acts 22 verse 16 says that baptism is the moment when our sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. There can be no argument, there can be no denying that baptism is essential for salvation. And true repentance will lead us to submission to that command. Repentance in that sense, then, is when we go from death to life. It's when we bury that old man of sin. When we say, I don't want to have anything to do with that way of life anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with those sins. I'm going to live a new life. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to turn toward God with everything that I am. I'm not just going to turn to another way of life that's equally wicked and sinful, but I'm going to turn to God, to righteousness, to wholesomeness, to purity of thought and action. I want to do what is right with all of my heart. That's what true repentance is. That's what Saul did, and that's what God expects of us. But repentance is incomplete without baptism. Repentance is incomplete unless we submit to the plain and simple commands of Jesus Christ to be baptized for the remission of sin. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, those are the two things that Peter said to his Jewish brethren on the day of Pentecost. Once they understood what they had done, once they had been pricked in their hearts by the accusation of Peter and the other apostles that they had killed their Lord and Savior, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Full submission, full repentance means that we will go from a state of unacceptability, a state of counterfeit faith, 
to full submission even to the commands that we've been told were unnecessary all our lives. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Repentance is incomplete if it stops short of fulfilling the command to be baptized. I hope that you understand this now. I hope that you realize what you need to do in order to be saved. Faith is absolutely essential. Faith is necessary. Repentance is necessary. This wholehearted change from the ways of the world, the ways of darkness, from all sin, wholeheartedly to face God and desire to give Him everything that we are and submit to His every command, including that command to be baptized. If I can help you, if we can help you in any way, contact us. We'd love to get together study. If you're ready to be baptized, we can help you do that. If you need prayers, contact us and we'll pray with you. Let's pray at this time. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful to know that we can understand what you have asked us to do. And we're thankful, Father, to know that none of the commands that you've given us are too difficult. They're not grievous to us, Father. They are simple commands to obey. We pray that our belief is wholehearted. We pray that our repentance is sincere. And we pray that our submission to you is complete. Be with those who are suffering and hurting at this time. Father, bless those who are elderly. We pray for a special blessing upon those who are serving and uh, and who are on the front lines of this virus and this disease, who are medical professionals. We pray your blessings upon them. We pray that our worship is acceptable. We pray that you will bless us, that we might be able to assemble together soon. And we pray that we might continue faithful until that time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.